It is SEC Media Days, the wrap-up show. Four days in Nashville, and wow, what a day it was for Tennessee. I thought Tennessee came off really strong. Joe Milton, of course, asked about his arm strength on several occasions. Jacob Warren, one of the uh, best, most well-spoken athletes that uh, we saw take the podium this week. And then you had Omari Thomas, who I thought was very affable as well. So for the most part, I thought Tennessee showed out incredibly well. Caleb Calhoun, what did you think? Yeah, they had a little moxie about them. You know, Josh Heifel talking about the UT. There's there's one U, there's one real UT. He played that, taking a shot at Texas. And you're right, Joe Milton talked a little more about his arm strength. Amari Thomas said that they were going to win the SEC East this year. Don't know how true that is, but it's a very interesting comment to make. And Milton talked a little bit about playing in the swamp. So I, I, I wouldn't say there was any level of arrogance, but there was a good bit of moxie. I thought it was kind of similar, actually, to uh, 2022 and that there was confidence there. At the time, I wondered if the confidence was misplaced. We certainly learned that wasn't the case. But a guy who certainly has confidence and should, and I don't think I asked him about his arm strength. I may be the only guy. Here's our discussion with uh, Joe Milton the third. If you want to hear more from the balls, go to our YouTube channel. We had a little fun with Joe, Omari, and Jacob. Because we realize they've been asked the same old questions a million times. So here is Joe Milton, Tennessee senior quarterback. Joined by Tennessee quarterback Joe Milton. And Joe, this is your year. Exciting stuff, man. You ready? Absolutely. Man. I'm more than ready. I'm more than ready. So you've asked, you've probably been asked about a million times about your arm strength. Yeah. So I'm not going to go there. And you've been asked a million times about replacing Hendon Hooker. I've heard all that, so let's go in a different direction. For sure. For sure. All right. Oppenheimer or Barbie? If you had to see op- the new movies that come out, Oppenheimer or Barbie. Are you a movie what's, guy? I am, but what's Oppenheimer? It's about the uh, A-bomb or something. I don't know. But if you had to watch one of those movies. I'd choose that one over Barbie for sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's one with my sisters or something. Uh, that one over Barbie for sure. Absolutely. Well, uh, Jacob said he's going he's gonna to see both, so give him a hard time about Barbie. Both. both. But, yeah, he's going to see Barbie. I mean, I don't know what's the deal. Jacob's with watching this. Good luck, Jacob. <laughs> Good luck with that. All right. Uh, beyond well, this weekend, Ed Sheeran was in the Nationals last weekend. You can only see one concert here. You said Beyonce who? Ed Sheeran. Oh, Beyonce. That's not even close, yeah, is it? Beyonce. You like it? Then you should have put him right here. Yeah, your 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 favorite singer of all time is. You be a young boy. Can you a singer? Oh, Fantasia. Fantasia. All right, I can roll with that. All right, strongest little guy on the team. By little guy, I mean a skilled position, so you could qualify for that. The strongest little guy on the team. I'm not gonna incorporate me because I'm bigger than the person that's uh, that it is. But I'm gonna say the strongest little guy, Wes Walker. Uh, Wes okay. Wes, yeah, Wesley Walker. All right, I got a pound. He was strong. All right. Like, all right. Fastest big guy. And I'll go ahead and tell you that Cooper Mays told me personally that he was slow. We just have to think about Cooper. Uh, I'm going to say either James Pierce, David Hobbs, or Tyler Barron. Or Josh. Dang. I got to say Spider. Yeah, Spider fast, too. That's a pretty good group. It is. Those some guys are running. That's some. That's definitely some some athleticism. Oh, I forgot one. My left tackle, Big John. John Campbell can run too. I saw him do like eight pull-ups. Yeah, Big John can run. Big John is strong. Instead of asking you how far you can throw the ball, how many pull-ups can you do? How many pull-ups can I do? Uh, depends on the day. Depends on the day. How many do you think I can do? I probably like twelve each. <laughs> <laughs> how, about, how about six? I had six the other day. I was proud it's a of mindset. It's a mindset. That's right. Well, I don't cheat. I, 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 I do all the way. Um, th- this is on my list, too, but it's about you. Joe Milton's most significant trait other than his arm strength. Uh, the way that I play the drums. You play the drums? How long have you played the drums? Well... It's not the church drums. I play. I can play the snare drums, the quads, the tenor drums. I used to. So my favorite move is drumline. I can play every beat off drumline. 
Really? Yeah. So, who, who's who's your roommate? You have a I don't have a roommate no more because the, the drums. <laughs> <laughs> now I kind of play those in my closet. You got a drum kit in your car. I have a, I have a snare pad. Wow. So who's your? Do you have a favorite drummer of all time? Nah. Uh, no favorite drummer. Okay. So do, like John Bonham of Led Zeppelin, does that mean anything to you? It's because I'm too old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nah. Nick Cannon. Was that Nick Cannon? Nick Cannon. Yeah. There you go. So as, as far as you and Hendon as a person, I find it interesting that you both are so comfortable in front of the camera, but he's kind of quiet. You seem like maybe you enjoy it. Um, I'm quiet. It depends on what we're doing. Um, but if a person made me feel like I'm at home and have fun, I'm happy. Yeah. Do you feel like you're at home now? Yeah. Like, have fun. If, if I had a drum set right now, I'd go crazy. Sweet. Okay, so if you were to if you were to watch any sports movie or you remember any sports movie, what's your favorite sports movie? Favorite sports movie. Uh, I don't remember the. Remember the title? No. No. Little Giants. Little Giants. Okay. I asked Jacob this, and I said, "When's the last time you cried during a movie?" And he said, uh, "Guardians of the Galaxy Three. Have you ever cried over a movie? Oh uh, yes. I don't know, man. It's kind of weird. I don't like. I don't even like talking about it, but I'll talk about it for you. But like, when when people like, it can be any type of movie where somebody gets help and they just feel sad. I just sometimes I shed a tear. I don't know if that's because of my heart. I got a kind heart, but I don't know. Give me give me an example of a, a, a kind heart. Um, where did you get the kind heart from? I my guess. grandmother. Your grandmother. My grandmother. Yeah. What's your grandmother's name? Barbara. Barbara. Yeah. She's. I mean, she just. It don't matter if you do anything wrong to her. She's still gonna care for you no matter what. Uh, she's gonna show you the same amount of love she did when she was mad at you. So, but she hardly ever get mad at anybody. Um, just because she's. She's so happy all the time. Um, and I mean, she goes through a lot. So. Anything she need, I'm here for. When, when's the last time you called Barbara for advice? For advice? I kind of don't. I don't. I never call for advice. Um, I mean, every time I answer, she answers the phone. She talks about God immediately. So I don't really call for advice. Um, also, her mother, my great grandmother. Um, it's kind of like I just lost my great grandmother this year, um, but they're fine. So my grandmother now has two people inside of her. It's two people in one. So therefore, I don't need advice. I just have God. That's pretty incredible. So when when there's hard times, when you transfer, when you're not the starter any longer at Tennessee, how much is Barbara and the strength that she gave you a part of getting through those times? Uh, Praying wise, she gave me a lot of strength. Um, but through all that, all I got up, I had to realize who I was. Because, I mean, usually everybody want to be your friend at the top, right? But when I got hurt and I went through those things, nobody was there for joke, except for my coaches. Um, but I went through that myself. And maybe your great grandmother passing away. Passing away. What's what's the toughest time you've been through as a man, a person, or a football player? Um, when I thought I was going to be done with football, uh, when I thought I wasn't good enough for it, um, but that was just a reevaluation curve of myself, uh, understanding what do I bring to the table, uh, how do I answer those questions? Like if I ask myself in the mirror, like what does Joe bring to the table? And there's a lot of things Joe brings to the table, so why give up on that? When was that? Uh, Twenty twenty one. How'd you get over it? Smiling. Uh, and also just everything I did wrong, just go do it right. So I basically gave myself a second opportunity. Good for you, man. I'm a fan of this too. Joe Joe Milton <laughs> right away. Joe Milton with Tennessee at SEC Media Days. This has been a presentation of Off the Hook Sports. Thank you. That was Joe Milton. Before we get to a discussion that Caleb Calhoun had with Omari Thomas, I remind you, go to crafttreats.com, crafttreats.com, use the promo code off the hook for 20% off. 
And if you use that promo code, you can take advantage of the chill pills with the CBD treats. The chill pills are absolutely fantastic. If your pet has any sort of arthritis issues, anxiety issues, or or maybe even digestive issues, the CBD will help. That's crafttreats.com. Use the promo code off the hook. Here's Tennessee defensive lineman Omari Thomas with Caleb Calhoun. Joined by Tennessee football defensive lineman Amari Thomas. Amari, how's it been so far? It's been amazing. It's been amazing. It's been a fun time talking to a lot of people, meeting a lot of people. It's been fun. So before we talk a little ball, there's some very serious questions you have to answer first. Let me answer them. Barbie or Oppenheimer? Barbie. Okay. Ed Sheeran is performing in Nashville this week. Beyonce performed last week. Beyonce or Ed Sheeran? Beyonce. You're from Memphis. Key Glock or or Moneybag Yo? Moneybag. Okay. All right. I actually agree with you. Yeah, Moneybag. Moneybag. I grew up in the 360 Yo era, so a little bit different. But if you like old school, 360 Yo who are you taking? Um, Three six. We agree on everything right here. Three six. Uh, so talking a little bit, obviously, there's been a lot of talk about Chelsea defense, mm-hmm. but there wasn't a lot of criticism of the defensive line last year. You guys did a lot of good work in the middle. How much, how crucial is it for you guys to really take the pressure off the secondary, given the fact that y'all are on the field a lot? Yeah, it's um, very important for us because we understand that um, we're one. So if people talk about the defensive backs, we consider that you're talking about the defensive line as well because we, we all – have the same goal was to win the SEC East. So we all know that we need to be able to do that and we need each other to do that. I need to be able to know what the linebackers doing. Linebackers need to be able to know what the DBs are doing just so everything runs smoothly, every, everything flows. And I feel like we just will be able to do that and we'll be way better and than we're, what we were last year and just show improvement because that's all we do is try to improve. What are some ways you developed in the off season from last year? Um, ways I developed was just um, continuing to always improve my endurance, always improving my endurance. You know, you can get a chance where you play so many snaps because our offense can go so fast, and we love it because that just gives us way more opportunities to be out there on the field and make more plays. But um, working on my endurance, working on individual pass rush, run block, just the small things, just not getting complacent with my game and just continuing to grow. How much does practicing against that offense every day prepare you guys for in-game situations? It's amazing because, like, you go against a fast offense like that at practice where there are no refs, really. It's way faster than it is in a game. So then you get a chance to go against guys and you're like, oh, I'm actually, I'm not that winded because they're using a whole play clock. So they're snapping the ball when you get about two, three seconds where we snap the ball when you get, what, to 30? What did what, what the play call start, 40? Uh, 40. Yeah, we snapping the ball and get to 30. So if that, if 30. So it's amazing just to be able to go against those guys every weekend, understand and know how we're growing as players. So obviously right before you you emerged last year, Matthew Butler was drafted into the mm-hmm. NFL. Do you think an underrated part of, of Josh Heupel's offense or Josh Heupel's system is that it really allows for players in the trenches to thrive even though it moves so fast? Yeah, I think um, just we're a team that we want to be – we want to attack. We don't want to be attacked. So there's something that we just look at all the time is just continuing to grow and continuing to just do what we do. And I, I enjoy it so much that the uh, defensive style that we play and we're able to continue to work and we're able to continue to make plays. So when you and Gerard Fragon's line up every now and then, I'm guessing, I'm guessing y'all sometimes go head to head in practice. Mm-hmm. Who yeah. wins? It's mixed. He wins some, I win some. It's great, it's great competition. It's a chance for us to just continue to grow. And he's good, I'm good. And we understand that going against each other every day in practice is just gonna continue to make us better. So that way we're able to dominate guys in the trenches on the Saturdays. What's the adjustment been like this? Well, what was it like in spring practice, I guess? Because Jeremy Banks was gone, mm-hmm. and you had to have that transition at linebacker. Yeah. I know Keenan Peely stepped in, Aaron Beasley's there, Arian Carter's a freshman. What's the transition been like with with the change at linebacker? Because I know that affects how you guys rush the passer all together. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say it hasn't been a true fall off. We, um, the way the program was, the program is ran, everybody does what the coach is telling them to do. So he's everyone's being coached up the same way. So we understand that when Keenan Pilly come in, Aaron Carter, Aaron Beasley, when they come in, they're all 
working the same way. So it's important for us to know that even how they're working, they know how we work just so we can work off each other and we can all make plays. Are there former Tennessee defensive linemen that you try to emulate your game after? Um, not necessarily. Not really. Not really. I would say, like, yeah, not really. That game's totally different from uh, back then. Yeah, not really. Yeah. So where do you think you can be in terms of the SEC this year as a defensive lineman? Where, how, where could you rank among the SEC's elite defensive linemen this year? I think I um, – just me being personal, I think I'm one of the best defensive linemen in the SEC. Just knowing the work I put in, the guys around me, and just always pushing me as well. And I just truly think that we're one of the best defensive linemen in general and the SEC, whether it's, we don't really believe in a lot of individual work. We know that we're all together. And I think that us being together will show how much we've grown and it will show everyone who really is the best like, in the SEC. And y'all's defense as a whole, where do, you, where do you think it could stand with the rest of the SEC this year? I think it stands in the top of the pack. Honestly, because I just think we're such a veteran defense. We've grown, we've matured, we've been through things. So it is just, um, I feel like we're standing at the top of the pack and just able to show who we are and show everything we've been through, the adversity, and just be able to continue to grow as the season goes. How much was the Georgia game last year? You guys played Georgia in the rain. I know it was just kind of a soggy, just mushy day, I guess. How much did that, the, the, how, how much did that send a message of, well, I don't want to say send a message, but, did that give you guys like a measuring stick of where you guys kind of want to be? Uh, I mean, I just feel like playing a team like Georgia, who's a great team, went on to win a national championship, um, get a chance to play against those guys every year. It's amazing because they have teams, great teams, and you are in those games where you're able to showcase your talent and everything. So I think we're headed in the right direction as a program, and we understand what we have to do to get the job done for different games. But we're just really, I'm not going to lie to you, we just focus on winning, going 1-0 and every game, and we're not really focusing on other teams that's down the road. What's a game last year, one of the bigger games y'all won, where you look back and you're like, oh, we made it, they were offensive line. We just won that, that won those battles. I think I would say um, just playing the a lot of the game, it, it was several games where we just had total domination of people just being able to stop the run, being able to affect the quarterback, just being able to really just get into it and just feel like we played smooth and was having fun. Last thing before we let you get out of here, your former teammate, uh, Trey Flowers, revealed that mm -hmm. he was playing all last year with an illness mm -hmm. and kept him out of camp. What is that? What does he as a player mean to you? Because I you guys, because I know he was a leader last yeah. year. And, Trey means a lot. You know, he's a guy who really is just a humble dude, real laid back, real vibey. He likes to do everything just to have fun. And Trey, actually, we used to hang out a lot, just me, Trey, and Jabari, just chilling at the house playing games and things like that. So it was good just to be able to um, know that he got cleared and everything and he's able to be in that situation. But I, I, I pray for Trey all the time, just happy for him. Just happy. I pray for all my teammates, all the teams I ever played on, the people I've ever played with. Just pray for everybody, man. Just because like things like that is something that you can't really control. That's out of his control, and I know it probably crushed him a little bit, but it's just good to. I'm glad he's better now. He's clear, so I just hope someone is able to take a, a great opportunity on Trey, and he's able to showcase who he can be. Okay, one last question because I totally. I, I'm sorry, I meant to ask this beforehand. All good, all good. On a lighter note, you're here with Jacob Warren. You're from Memphis. He's from Knoxville. You, you, you've let him know that West Tennessee has a better high school football than East Tennessee, right? Facts. He knows. <laughs> he knows. Amari yeah. Thomas with uh, All the Hook Sports. This has been Caleb Calhoun. Thanks a lot, Amari. Yes, sir. Thank you. Have a good one. You too. And Craving Wings, South North Shore location, where we've heard people say that you can get the best wings in East Tennessee. Pero quien es este? El número 87, Jacob Warren. I'll just do six for my sauce, 87, please. Imposible, señorita. Dale seis más. Look at these wings. Perfectas, deliciosas, fantásticas. Man, I don't know what you're saying, but it sounds awesome. How do you say fresh, never frozen in Spanish? Frescas, nunca congeladas. Make your way to Craven Wings and get you seis más. But what was funny about Cadiz, we were a full continuum of care at that time. We had detox, we had inpatient, we had outpatient. So we were doing a lot of the things that we do now. 
but now we just do them so much better. It's really a simple program, but it's, we're complicated people. I am what I am, and now I gotta do something about it. You can take your life back. Call Cadis today. Got cataracts? We can fix that. Never miss another moment. With a little help from Drs. Campbell, Cunningham, Taylor, and Hahn at cctis.com. Do you want to own the more that owns every job? Then get to Vasty Lawn and Garden in Cleveland and get you a Toro. I'm David Vasty, here to talk to you about Toro. With a Toro Zero Turn, you'll get more out of every minute and you'll reach the finish line faster. At Bassies, we like to say, no matter if you're mowing three acres a week or 11 lawns a day, homeowners and business owners alike find confidence in equipment they can trust from top to bottom. Bassie Lawn and Garden, Highway 60 North in Cleveland. Man alive, it's worth the drive. Our family has been creating jewelry since 1986. Each piece unique with a story all its own. I'm Rick Terry with Rick Terry Jewelry Designs. I'm a jeweler, and I want to be your jeweler. We're grateful that you chose us to be Knoxville's best jeweler. My family and staff look forward to serving you. So please come see us. Kingston Pike and Campbell Station Road in the heart of Farragut and downtown on Gay Street, right next to the Tennessee Theater. All right, welcome back with Caleb Calhoun. I'm Dave Hooker, SEC Media Days. How about Jacob Warren, his favorite movie and the last movie to make him cry? Spoiler alert, Tennessee's tight end tells us that's brought to you by Zen Sports, the new sports book in Tennessee, revolutionizing the way you earn sports betting rewards. That means no more deposit bonuses that turn into deposit nightmares on Zen Sports. What you see is what you get with our cash rewards program. You get a lot of cash for a welcome bonus, earn an unlimited 5% cash back on your betting volume. For your first 15 days when you sign up with the promo code HOOK, that's HOOKED, H-O-O-K-E-D. That's right, unlimited 5% cash back. Keep betting and keep earning with up to 3% cash back on your betting volume every month after that. And refer friends to earn a percentage of their betting volume as cash rewards too. Zen Sports is bringing the cash back to Tennessee. So if you bet big on sports, you want to be betting on Zen Sports. Zen Sports betting just got better. Here is... Jacob Warren, Tennessee tied in. We visited with him at SEC Media Days. And you know this guy. He's on the ball report brought to you by Lawn and Garden. What in the world? We're in the same place yeah, in Nashville. That's weird, huh? <laughs> it's, weird. Not, it's not even our own homes. First of all, you look dapper, nice and clean, tight, looking good. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. That was, that was what we're going for. What do you think of this craziness, Jacob? Oh, my gosh. It's been a lot. A lot of the same questions. A lot of uh, good questions, but I'm having a good time. And this is obviously we talked about it, but just being able to represent myself, represent my family, represent the university um, in front of all these people is really cool. All right, I'm going to break it up. I'm just going to go out and left field. So I got uh, five goofy questions. All right, I'm not, not going to let. I'm not going to look at them. All right, so, okay. It. Oppenheimer or Barbie? Oh man, probably both. Honestly, we'll do the Oppenheimer. <laughs> We're calling it Oppenheimer. Me and my friends. We're going to see the Oppenheimer. So we'll probably go watch, do a little doubleheader. Um, I don't know when, but they'll both be watched. But if you only could see one, ah, uh, Oppenheimer. I think I like history movies like that. They're cool. I like that. Ed Sheeran played here last week. Beyonce this week. You can only see Beyonce. One. That's not even close. Beyonce. Yeah. That's. Beyonce. I mean, what if Jay Z makes an appearance? Right. She's a legend. So is he. But Ed's a legend too. But. Beyonce is more of my speed, probably. Okay. On on your football team, the strongest little guy. The strongest little guy. And you're not a little guy. So I'm thinking skilled position players. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Smaller than uh, you. Uh, Jalen Wright. Jalen Wright. Strong. Oh so strong. Extremely strong. Lower body, upper body, both. Everything. Everything. That guy's a tank. Okay. The fastest big guy. So that has to be a lineman. Again, tight ends don't count. You're the hybrid, yeah. so you don't fit any of this. Sure, sure. Um, man, I wouldn't even know. It's probably a D lineman. It's like Morgan Joseph. Is that – not Morgan Joseph. Uh, Josh. Joshua Joseph. Josh Joseph. Is he, like, kind of a big guy? I consider him a big guy. That guy's fast. Tyler Barron's fast. I'm trying to think of offensive lineman. Uh, <laughs> is that sad that I can't think of offensive lineman? No, because I know Cooper's probably very slow. Cooper will tell you he's slow, too. 
<laughs> no, we got we got some fast guys. Like uh, Sprags is fast. He, he runs. He runs really hard. I don't know. They're all honestly, we have some athletic bigs, but probably a defensive line. For sure. Going back to movies, your favorite sports movie? Um, uh, Happy Gilmore. Ooh, oh yeah, strong. Sleeper. Oh yeah. Yeah, is it, have you seen Fill the Dreams? I have not. Okay, is there is there a movie? What's the last movie that made you cry? Oh, um, it actually wasn't that long ago. Uh, <laughs> Guardians of the Galaxy three. Oh yeah, when I've, Groot when Groot was like, "I love you guys," and like that's the first time. I don't know if you guys understand, but like Groot. For those that don't know, my family that is watching this, I know you guys don't know. Um, Groot is a character in Guardians of the Galaxy. He's like a branch he's a tree. tree. He's a tree. He's a big tree, and he walks, and he's like super strong. But he only says, "I am Groot." All he says, is, "I am Groot." So if you say, "Hey Groot, how are you?" He'll go, "I am Groot." If he says, uh, "Groot, go get this," he'll be like, "I am Groot." So <laughs> you can't understand him, and all the people in the movie understand him. All the people in their little group, in their little family, and so at the end of the movie, I'm spoiling it. If you haven't it's seen it, good, it, doesn't matter. I think it's spoiler. I'm ever. spoiling it at the very end of the movie. He goes. I love you guys. And really, to everyone else, he's saying, I am Groot. But because you've watched this far, you're now part of the family. And you can understand what Groot's saying. That's pretty oh, awesome. Yeah. Guardians of Galaxy 4, he's talking the whole time, I guarantee you. Hopefully there's another one. So that, that, that's a great one. Oh, yeah. I'm going to go see the movie, and yeah, you ruined a little Sorry. bit of it. <laughs> Sorry. But um, as far as uh, the most emotional player on your team, like who cries the most? Yeah, who is just um, like out there a little bit? I don't know, dude. A lot of the guys, you know, egos. I don't know if I've actually ever seen a person cry because of like emotions before at football. I don't think that's a thing. It's a thing, but I don't think it is right now. Like I'm nervous. What about just in terms of maybe emotions from them? You admitted you cried. I mean, it, it, who wears their emotions on their sleeve? Um, one of my boys, Parker Ball, and not even in a bad way, like. In the best way possible. Where's his emotions on his sleeve? If he's upset, he'll tell you he's upset. If he's sad about something, he'll tell you he's sad about it. So he's super, I'll say more genuine more than anything. Good stuff. Okay, so at Media Days, is there any question that you felt like, because you and I talked about this before, is there any question that you felt like maybe somebody was trying to dig a little too deep? Um, Not too deep. Everyone's really respectful, at least has been so far. Um, you get questions about other teams for sure. Like you get questions about, like a guy asked me earlier, um, how we beat Missouri so bad the past two years, and I was like, I don't know, dude. We're we're just better than them on that day. You know what I mean? Like there's nothing. There's no secret sauce. Like it's not just a reason we beat them, but um, nothing crazy. There's definitely some people trying to like you know get some some uh, engineer responses, but nothing bad. Well, last thing, and it was on my list, and I forgot it. Joe Milton's strongest trait other than his arm. Um, Did you read on my notes? No, I didn't. <laughs> um, Joe Milton's strongest trait other than his arm. Uh, his personal ability. He's like the most, like, I feel like the most connected on the team. He's got handshakes with everybody, like, says hey to everybody. He's a great leader and, like, really has shown up for everybody as far as, like, being that guy that you can look to and be like, okay, that guy's going to take over. He's going to lead. I think so. His leadership and his just personality in general. Last thing, kind of football. It's just how excited are you to get rolling? I can't wait, dude. I, I, I love the cameras. I love the lights. I love talking to people. I love doing the interviews, but there's nothing like being out there just doing what we all talk about all year. So. He's the best. Lucky and blessed to work with this guy. Jacob Warren, you can check him out on the Ball Report brought to you by Bassey Water Garden. He is Jacob Warren. This has been a production of Off the Hook Sports. We go from a current ball to a former ball that's right jacob warren uh we visited with i can't believe he cried over guardians of the galaxy three honestly i that's, don't un, I, it's not the movie i would have picked that he cried over that's not even the marvel movie i would have picked that he would cry over and i'm not the biggest marvel fan i think it's just destruction porn half the time oh more than it is. Gosh, i'm sorry i'm dude. sorry hater absolutely love those movies people right. hated on man of steel for destruction porn marvel's not much better all right here we go david cutcliffe joins us now former tennessee offensive coordinator twice as a matter of fact former Ole miss coach now a special assistant to the sec commissioner also former duke coach great success there love visiting with david cutcliffe on off the hook sports david cutcliffe 
the special assistant to the SEC commissioner, but you might also know him as one of the best quarterback coaches of all time, one of the best men of all time in the coaching profession. Just uh, a fantastic individual. David, thanks for taking the time. Thanks, Dave. You know, you and I do this pretty well together. Uh, we have a little experience, right? We, we do. We, we did a show for a year together back in the day, and it was, uh, I can honestly say, some of my funnest times in, in radio. It was it was really a recovery for me after coming off open heart surgery, getting fired and coaching. Uh you, you guys were my support base. Seriously, you were my team. Yeah. I have no team suddenly for the first time in decades after decades. And so I appreciate that. And I should say that more often publicly. Thank you. Well, and thank you. I felt like I learned so much more of your all's perspective, of a coach's perspective. And uh, just I think it probably brought a little bit more empathy to both of us in terms of what each other are going through uh, and you know and that was a particularly tough time too that we don't necessarily need to get into with, with tennessee but there are no tough times right now at tennessee football uh did you like that transition there it was yeah good. that was really good and <laughs> I'm, I'm really happy for the people the fans the great incredible fans of the university of tennessee and they're living some some good moments right now it's not an accident either Coach Heupel uh, impressed me. I went down and watched him practice when he was at Central Florida. Mm -hmm. And uh, his spring practice was extremely impressive. And I knew in my heart there that, okay, this was a special coach, an extremely special coach. And then I had experience of playing against him as a player. We played Oklahoma in the Independence Bowl when he was the quarterback, uh, mentored by the, the late Mike Leach. And so Josh Heupel got a great start as a player who he was mentored by, certainly his dad being a coach. But he's no accident and he's no flash in the pan. He got a good one. I, I, think, I think they certainly do. I'm curious – some of the rule changes in particular that benefit RPO and that sort of thing. If you're a 28 year old David Cutcliffe coming into coaching or 24 year old, 22, whatever, would you have the same philosophy that, that you had throughout your career or would it be altered by the fact that the game is a bit different? Well, you have to be altered. Okay. I mean, you got to, I have a son coaching actively right now. And so we talk offensive football. We talk, a lot, and we were using RPOs, of course, at Duke, but um, you have to take advantage of everything that you learn. And then all that said, if you will watch the Josh Hypers of the world, you can still take care of the football. Mm -hmm. There are certain things that won't change. There are certain things that have to change. The field's getting smaller. And the reason it's getting smaller is the defenses are so much bigger and faster than when I came on the scene. So you have to utilize the width of the field, which they do exceptionally well in Tennessee offense, but you also have to use the vertical parts of the field, which they do exceptionally well. They know the kind of player they want to put together, but when your passing game is both vertical and horizontal, you know what else you can do pretty good? run the football that's right and you always placed a big emphasis on that i think that gets lost because you were such a great quarterback coach and it kind of gets lost with josh heifel's offense too because they are so sick. but both of you guys were predicated on running the football no question and one of the reasons we were successful was using the width and what we call the quick game. Mm -hmm. we were we were so good at using we made people defend the flats of the field that's okay. right because they were getting bigger and faster then. What I didn't do as good a job of as I should have, we did okay in this, but you also have to make people deepen and defend vertically. And I think he's done a terrific job of that. But we, we, we did a lot of at the line stuff. Um, the best way you can train a quarterback is ultimately he should be able to call the game. He should know everything you know 
and then everything he knows as the functional part, and now you've got some magic. So, you know, I would often tell the guy on the sideline, point, just point at Peyton. He'll know what, what that means. Um, I'm not down there on the field, and, you know, he can get somebody set and look at them and then call a play. Wouldn't that be nice for coach if you could see every defense they were going to be in before it came out of their mouth? People don't realize what a play clock does. As soon as the tackle's made, something is coming out of your mouth. You've got to have the play call based on down the distance with hash mark, air the field, score of the game, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That all has to be communicated to the sideline, sideline to the field. That's why no huddle has been helpful. But when you can just predicate all that, I have this guy so well trained, he's going to call what I would call once he's seen. It's pretty strong. What What did you What have you learned? Because you said you, you knew quite a bit about Josh Heupel beforehand from visiting him at UCF and from coaching against him when, when he was a player. So you knew a lot. You knew what he was going to roll out there. But what have you learned in the past 365 days since I last spoke to you about him maybe as a game day coach, about him as, as a coach. What have you learned most recently about him? I, I think there is, when, when I watch him now, I get to go obviously more often to practice and hear him and have conversations with him. It's not an accident that they're going to be good on defense and in the kicking game. He understands the game. Mm -hmm. um, I have young people ask me all the time, how do I become a head coach? I said, why don't you try to become the best football coach on your staff? So, meaning offense, defense, kicking. Uh, coach Heifel is, is a really all-around, really good football coach. The other thing I think he does is he reads his team and the people around him really well. Uh, you know, maybe that's the quarterback. I don't know. He gets a sense of what a team needs and how they're going to respond. I was over there, uh, I guess it was last August, their preseason practices. And he hit them with a surprise, basically, night off. I've never heard an eruption like I heard from that team, but he knew that team and coaches had hit maybe a zero return or a negative return on time. That can happen. That's a sixth sense that the great ones have to have. Uh, so, you know, there's more to it than just saying line up and have a scheme and call a play. you got to build a program, and I certainly believe he's doing that at Tennessee. How much does that coincide with – that? In when you were – in, in the 90s at Tennessee, there was a closeness, there was a bond. There, there might even be a book coming out about that. But you, th there seems to be, and I think it's legitimate, both on and off the record, people I talk to, there's a closeness and a bond. How important is that, especially in this day and age of transfer portal, NIL, that sort of thing? That's the program, though. and it starts with genuine relationships. I've so told this to so many young coaches getting into the business. You better understand there's no bigger fool on earth than one that thinks they can fool a young person. You better care and you better be genuine. With that becomes a respect between not only coaches and players and players and coaches, but the same thing's true with coaches and coaches and players to players. If that's the culture that you can grow, and that's what I'm seeing and what I'm referring to about caring. If, if you can grow that culture, but saving the day called it a mindset. Mm -hmm. um, and it is that, but I've used the term culture. Yeah. I still write about culture and, and how you can develop it and what you have to do on a consistent basis. And as I go watch all of these programs in the Southeastern Conference more closely than I've ever been able to, that's one of the things I look for. 
T. Martin had to sit and wait. He had to sit an extra year that he didn't think he was probably going to have to wait. Joe Milton had to sit last year, and it would have been even easier for him to transfer than it would have been for T. What do you think that says about his character? And if you were to give him any advice stepping into that role now, what would it be? Well, I, I said it to him. I already told him personally, I don't get any involved with coaching players or saying too much to any player. But when I saw him, I complimented him. I said, Joe, it tells me about everything I need to know about you that you stay in this environment and era of college football. I commend you for that. It'll, it'll pay dividends. Persistence and perseverance are great traits and take advantage of it. And I would tell him the same thing now as you play. Uh, it's not going to be easy. Okay. And everybody talks about the big arm. They talk. I don't care what everybody talks about. I want Joe to focus on two things being the best teammate on the team. When a quarterback is the best teammate, on team you've got so you're not trying to make plays you're trying to put other people in a position to make plays you are truly appreciating what your kicking game and your defense are doing for you to set you up um, be a great teammate and then the other thing he can't forget we all chose to play this game because we thought it was fun to play it's got to stay fun to play and if you start worrying about your statistics or you start focusing on what people think about you, that's no fun. It's like you remember being the first time when you're young and maybe it's middle school. You start to be able to become aware of your physical looks or what other people think about you. You didn't think about that as a kid. It's a tough time in your life. Um, don't do that as a quarterback. It's fun. Be a great teammate. Focus on your teammates, not yourself, and, and focus on when you do that, you can have fun. Focus on this great game is fun, and the rest of it will take care of itself. When you we, – we spoke with Hinton Hooker this week, and we talked about the occasional overthrows that he had as he was getting used to Josh Heifel's offense. And he, he shared something that I hadn't heard before. He said it wasn't necessarily accuracy issues – it was chemistry and being on the same page of his receiver issues that he was throwing the ball to a spot and either he or the receiver wasn't reading the right defense. And I'm curious, as as a guy who knows so much about football, can you tell the difference between an errant throw or maybe not on the same page when you're watching? Yeah, usually if I'm studying film, I'm looking at the quarterback's lower body for overthrows, not, not his release. The lower body is going to dictate a, a bunch of that. Your footwork, your base, your finish uh, with the lower body. Uh, what he's talking about happens. It happens in the NFL. It's happened to some of my guys at times with coaching changes in the NFL. When receivers aren't ready, when you're ready, and receivers are too early or short. Or, and what, what I would tell Joe is don't talk about that your job starter or backup and i use this term as Peyton man uh, when i see it on the practice field where they're not on the same page all i've ever had to yell since Peyton is Peyton Manning. that means that quarterback better sprint down there that receiver i'm not worried about games and what i'm seeing at games i'm worried about what i'm seeing at practice uh, practice makes permanent a lot of people use say Perfect practice makes perfect. Practice doesn't make perfect. Well, neither one of them do. Practice makes permanent. So don't be surprised in the game mode, Joe, if that's happening, if you haven't done well enough in the communication aspect of it as a player, you follow what I'm saying. Sure. Uh, attack that problem uh, on the practice field. So let me leave you with this, and, I'm, and, and, and I'm, I'll let you go. I appreciate your time. Do you, from what you've seen in practice and in game, do you think Joe Milton is an accurate passer? Yeah, he, the ball, he gets the ball where he wants it to go. Uh, I think anybody with that kind of arm dynamic has to work on throwing the ball with their fingers. He's so strong. 
you throw a football, no different than you hit a baseball with your fingers. It's not your arm, not your hand. You throw a football with your fingers. And so that's the whole thing you focus on is what do you shoot a basketball with? Your fingers. I could talk to you five days about this, but Chuck Dunn Life is going to kill me. I, <laughs> I appreciate we'll it. Dave. Visit again. We'll do it. I appreciate, I appreciate it. it. David Cuckliffe right there. Sun, sand, and salt water. The beach is a very relaxing place. Unless you wear contacts. Ow! Open your eyes to the best the beach has to offer with LASIK vision correction from Campbell Cunningham Laser Center. Ah. Hi, Mike Davis here with City Heating and Air, reminding you to always dare to compare. Our team provides quality local heating and air service, installation, and maintenance across East Tennessee. We use only the best equipment like American Standard Heating and Air Conditioning for your residential, new construction, or commercial needs. Honesty, dependability, and customer satisfaction have been the cornerstones of our business since 1961. City Heat and Air. There's your man. Our family has been creating one-of-a-kind pieces of jewelry in West Knoxville since 1986. Each piece is a combination of unique processes that bring your idea to life. Every day in our shop, a truly special item with a story all its own is being manufactured in our facility, bringing the history and family sentiment into a whole new generation of life. We are grateful that you chose us to be Knoxville's best jeweler, a title that we value and respect. Because to me, being a jeweler and owning a jewelry store are not the same thing. I'm Rick Terry, I'm a jeweler, and we want to be your jeweler. Kingston Pike and Campbell Station Road in the heart of Farragut and downtown on Gay Street right next to the Tennessee Theater. When you want a hard cider that's easy to enjoy, one that's crafted to perfection, you need Tennessee Cider Company. Some say it's the signature cider of the South. Others say it's the cure to your craving. They all say you'll savor every sip. With a selection of ciders free to sample, all it takes is one taste. Visit TNCiderCompany.com for more information, as well as to shop our ciders and merchandise online. Thirsty yet? Doors open at 10 a.m. Welcome back. Coming up, how about Cole Kubelik with WJOX and the SEC Network, who is unbelievable at breaking down offensive line play and more. One of the best analysts, in my opinion, in the biz. Cole Kubelik to join us very shortly. Also, Andy Staples now with On3. Uh, we'll get his thoughts on the SEC as we broadcast from SEC Media Days in Nashville, Tennessee. Here is Cole Kubelik of WJOX and the SEC Network. Cole Kubelik of Cube Show. Cole, thanks for doing this. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. So, Cole, we talk a lot about Tennessee football on our show, and you seem to know a lot about offensive linemen flipping positions. Yeah. Darnell Wright did it last year. We're hearing reports that Gerald Mincy is going to do it this year. What's significant about that? Tackle? Well, it depends on where you're going. If Yeah, if you're going from guard to tackle, obviously your footwork, your sets are going to change. Uh, your steps in the run game are going to be a little bit different. Center, obviously, to guard or tackle, you're not having a snap. Things are going to be different there. Um, now, going from left to right is, is different as well. Now, the good news for Tennessee is you're not in a three-point stance very often, so going from left to right wouldn't be as complicated. But still, mental weight is something that has to happen pre-snap. So if I'm a left tackle, my mental weight's on my right foot before I take my set. If I'm at right tackle, my mental weight's on my left leg before I take my set, things like that, understanding where to carry your hands, how to carry your hands, weight distribution's a little bit different, but these kids are athletes, man. Like They understand, and if you get enough reps at it going in, it, it, it's not as big of a challenge with a heads up. Where it becomes a challenge, I think, is in the middle of the season, you get two, three guys hurt, and all of a sudden your right tackle's gotta go to left tackle, or your left guard's gotta go to right guard, and they haven't been repping it leading up to the season or during the season. That's when I think it really becomes complicated. Yeah, I know Philip Fulmer's last season, Tennessee made the mistake of swapping guard positions in the middle of the game a lot well, of no, times. I said, see, that used to be normal. Um, when I first got to Auburn, you had strong side, weak side. So if our strength was to the right, the right guard, right tackle would go to the right side. If our strength was to the left, they would go to the left side. Folks flipped offensive lines for a long time. 
And then when tempo became a real part of playing offensive football, that's something that obviously took time. So you got rid of that. Then you had right tackle, left tackle, right guard, left guard. And so it's now it's just a waste of time to do it. And and so, but it used to it used to be that you had, I guess the, the mindset was probably our best two are going to be our strong two. But yeah, that just that used to be the way it was. Is in jo- in, in a tempo system like Josh Heupel's, I think the underrated part of his system is how much he relies on the run game. How important are the guards and the interior linemen for Josh Heupel to make his system work? Yeah, I think I, I don't think he relies on the run game. I mean, I think they have an emphasis on they want to run the football. Like it's they if they can go out and run the football fifty times and win a game, he's going to do it. And because I think that truly is what begins the pace. Like there are very few passes that lead them into tempo. Usually it's a run that leads them into being able to go fast. So the guards are huge. Like that's why I like watching Devontae Spragans. He's a guy that finishes extremely well. Like he's got that extra desire up until or past the whistle. Like he plays the game the way it's supposed to be played. Um, but it's all five of them, man. Like you can't you can't run that offense or any offense and have great tackles in the run game and guards that are insufficient in the run game or a center that's insufficient. So I think all five spots are important. Um in the run game specifically for Tennessee, you know, I would throw the tight end in as well. It's one of the things I thought that really separated them last year was not just how dominant the offensive line was, specifically Darnell, but the tight end inserts where they come in between the guard and tackle or split zone where the tight end comes flat across the line of scrimmage. They did a lot of things to steal the eyes of defenders with the tight ends. So it's not even just the offensive line that helps with how successful they've been running the football. What about when it comes to this system – how much of how much does it take advantage of the leeway in downfield blocking that's now allowed in college football? Um, first and foremost, I, I think the biggest differentiator in this offense is spacing. It's not tempo. It's not shot plays. Um, it's spacing. It's alignment. And what it does is when you have receivers that are literally a foot away from each sideline, it forces a defense to say, do we want our extra help to be over this group of receivers? You have two stack receivers. Do I want a third defender out there because we don't think we can tackle them? Or do I want an extra defender in the box to play against the run? That's a conflict. And when you put a conflict like that, it immediately gives you an advantage. Because wherever – and you want to try to play us in the middle? Okay, cool. We're going to attack you as an unknown defender. So that, to me, is the biggest part uh, of what makes this offense so difficult. Now – the downfield blocking aspect of it, I don't think that not being able to do that hinders or takes away from what this offense is. Are there some times maybe on a screen that it could be a little bit more beneficial? Yeah, but, I mean, it's just it's just not going to the ground is all it is. So, I mean, you can still block downfield. You can still find work downfield as a receiver, a tight end, a back, an offensive lineman, whatever. But I do think it, it may take away a couple of explosives a year because let's be honest, receivers aren't good blockers. So the fact that they can't go low anymore downfield or a back out of the backfield can't go low, and sometimes a lineman, because sometimes as a lineman, when you're out in space, you know good and well you're probably not going to actually square up a corner or a safety. Like, they're just quicker and faster than you. So if you can at least go low on them and, and get in the way and force them to retract, that can still open up enough room to create an explosive play. And not being able to do that anymore – it might take an explosive or two away every five or six games, but I don't think it really ever slows the offense down. So on a broader scale with the SEC, the two biggest questions I've heard this year so far are who wins the West, Alabama or LSU, and can Tennessee challenge Georgia at all in the East? So I want to ask you that latter one. Can Tennessee challenge Georgia at all, or is Georgia, do you think, is just too far ahead of them still? I think it depends on your definition of challenge. Can they be close to the standings at the end of the season? Yes, absolutely. Um but I think there are just more losable games on the schedule for Tennessee than there are Georgia. Therefore, even if Tennessee found a way to upset Georgia, I might still give Georgia the advantage based on the differential between them and the teams on their schedule, as opposed to the differential between Tennessee and the teams on their schedule. So, you know, Tennessee still has to play Georgia and Alabama. You know, Georgia doesn't have to play Georgia and Alabama. They play Alabama. So it's, or they play Tennessee. So I, I think the schedule differential, even if Tennessee gets that upset, it may actually still lean Georgia just because there are more difficult games on Tennessee's schedule. And on the other side, LSU and Alabama, is LSU, would you say they're would you say at this point they are on Alabama's level? Or do you LSU's the favorite in the West, in my opinion. They have a returning starting quarterback that we have confidence in. 
they're going to have one of the best offensive lines in the SEC. That's a part that people don't want to talk about for whatever reason. But you essentially have six starters back on that offensive line. Tight end returns. After Ohio State, I would put LSU's receiving core on par with anybody. Now, the league really good at receiver depth-wise. Tennessee's group's going to be really good. Kentucky has the best receiver room they've ever had. Georgia's receiving group, especially when you include tight ends, is incredible. Um, so I, I think there are some really deep receiving rooms in the league. Like Alabama's depth at receiver is great. They just don't have the A++ guy that's already done it. But I, I think that – I think when you talk about a receiver room and just a, a group of like aliens or robots, like LSU's got that. And they might have the best defensive player in the league. They have maybe the best tandem of defensive tackles in the SEC. So there are a lot of reasons that – you know, I think LSU, I would have them slightly ahead of Alabama. It's not that Alabama can't do it, may not do it. Uh, there are many ways that they can. They got that game in Tuscaloosa this year. But Alabama's got Texas, man. Alabama's got Tennessee, you know. Alabama's got all on the schedule, which is a rivalry game that's always good. I would lean LSU right now, but I do think it's a two-team race in the West to actually win the division. So last question before I let you out of here. So we've, we've talked about Tennessee challenging Georgia and then Alabama LSU. If there is one team that – should be considered a possible shocker that could win the SEC out of those four or at least play for the title, who should it be? Out of Alabama, Georgia, Tennessee, LSU? The outside of those four, not one of those four teams. The only other team I think that could possibly win the SEC would be Texas A&M, and it's because of their roster. Um, they are Their talent is as close to Georgia and Alabama and LSU as anybody else. Now – I think a team who could really surprise some people would be Kentucky. Like I just said, they have the best receiver room they've ever had. Now, I'm not saying they're better than Craig Yeast or better than Randall Cobb individually, but top to bottom, it's the best room they've had. Um, and they have one real problem that needs to be repaired. That's offensive line. They brought multiple guys in to be able to fix that. I think Marquez Cox will start at left, Northern Illinois transfer. I think he'll be good. SEC fans don't appreciate Ray Davis because he played here. He played at Vanderbilt. He's really good. They don't appreciate Devin Leary because he played at NC State. Devin Leary was a top three quarterback in college two years ago. Like the kid can act, he can play. He's good. You got Weaver back on the front of that defense. Oxen Dines back up front on that defense. Brad White's a great defensive coordinator. That's a group. And the back end of their schedule is brutal, but they're going to get a lot of momentum early. I mean, they could easily be five and zero playing Georgia. So Kentucky would be that team that I can that could separate that I don't think many people are talking about. He's Cole Kublik with the Cube Show. This is SEC Media Days for All the Hook Sports. This is Caleb Calhoun. Cole, thanks a lot. Thanks, Caleb. There you go. That was Cole Kublik. I remind you the portions of the program were brought to you by AndyMasonRealEstate.com. AndyMasonRealEstate.com, best service, best prices in the biz in East Tennessee. Your next real estate purchase or sell had better be with Andy Mason. That's AndyMasonRealEstate.com. Speaking of Andy's, Let's go to Andy Staples of On3, the longtime reporter recently joining On3. Always love visiting with Andy Staples on Off the Hook Sports. Welcome back. We broadcast live from SEC Media Days in Nashville, Tennessee. And this guy I've known for quite some time. He's now with On3 and he's about to crush it with podcast galore. Andy Staples, how are you, sir? I'm doing good. Doing good. We've got a couple shows out. We... Uh... Gonna keep making more shows, and it just keeps going day after day. And I, it's interesting because I've been a writer for so long, and that's been the primary thing. When people ask me what I do now, I'm like, um, it's a great question. <laughs> do it. I make a video show on YouTube that is also a podcast. Yeah, I, it, it doesn't. It doesn't make sense to to the olds, but the the kids know it. Know what I'm talking about. But, and the kids are important because they're the next wave. Well, 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 tell us about what the plan is for the show at, at On Three and uh, what you what you hope to bring to the table. Well, it's going to be the best. Well, second best college football show in America. Uh, but no, it, it, we're we're hoping it becomes your your favorite college football show and part of your daily rotation. Uh, it'll be out on YouTube. Sunday through Thursday, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. And so if you're a podcast listener, it, like, it'll be Monday, your Monday through Friday. It'll be ready for your commute. And, uh, you know, it just depends on how you want to take it. We want to kind of get it to you however you want. Because I do find that the, the older audience wants a podcast. The younger folks want to watch things on YouTube. And so we, we just want to make it the most fun college football show. You know, I, I don't – there's – 
there's a lot of different college football shows, but you know, some of them are way too serious. Some of them are uh, they're just focused on one conference or another. We're we're doing the whole country, and we are leaning into the fact that college football is the most fun sport in the world. I mean, think think about how insane this sport is. Think about the end of the Tennessee Alabama game last year, and and that scene. You don't get that in any other sport. No, it's a great point. Uh, Andy Staples joining us with on three now and. Andy, let me get your perspective since you kind of turned it towards football uh, out of what Tennessee has been able to do. I was pretty stunned. I thought eight wins last year would have been doable yeah. and nine would have been a good season. And then, boom, there they go. What did you think? I, I was very impressed. I thought because I had thought they had overachieved a little bit in Josh Heupel's first year relative to what he inherited because it, they had a – remember, everybody's jumping into the transfer portal after Pruitt got fired. You didn't know what was going to happen. You didn't know if they'd be any good. So they, they come out, and they're not only adequate that first year, but you saw a lot of potential there. But then you think about, okay, now Florida's got a new coach. Kentucky's At that point, Kentucky's rolling, and they're bringing back Will Levis, who's a, you know, a first-round draft pick type player. And you thought, okay, so do they regress to the mean a little bit here? No, they just kept going, and, and they got better and better. And I think you, you kind of realized it by the time you got to the Alabama game that this is a little bit different, and this, this may be something they can sustain. Certainly they were, they were cool on the recruiting trail. They, they you know, became one of those programs that they did NIL very well early, and so they had a lot of players looking at them and a chance to upgrade the roster. And then they also say what you will about Jeremy Pruitt's coaching, which was not particularly great. He did identify some talent and bring in some really good, especially big guys. And I think they've taken advantage of that. That's one thing I, I thought, you know, talking to the Tennessee coaches last year, they were so ecstatic when they got there from UCF to see what they inherited on the offensive line because they felt like they were so much more athletic than, than anything they'd ever had before on the line. It allowed to, them to expand what they do in the run game change the offense a little bit and what you saw was a, a very tough offense to stop I mean the only the only school that really shut that offense down was Georgia and you know South Carolina game was its own weird animal but I just think they're they're in position to be good year after year which is something you you kind of wonder would ever happen again at Tennessee you know you and I met during the Philip Fulmer era mm -hmm. they were ridiculously consistent back then and then they, it, that just stopped happening I think Josh Heupel might be the kind of guy who can create that consistency. I will say he's probably the perfect guy for that job because he cares deeply about the players. You can tell players like him. He doesn't give a crap what anybody else says about him, which has been a problem at Tennessee right. over the years. And, and it's one of those places where I, I tell people Tennessee's the highest pressure job in sports other than maybe New York Yankees manager. I think wow. it's a higher pressure job than Alabama. I think it's a higher pressure job than Notre Dame, Ohio State, because it's it is the most passionate fan base that is obscenely interested in every little thing that happens in the program. Everybody's got something to say about everything that happens. There's a obviously, like you, Hook. There's a lot of folks who cover the program. Everybody has an opinion. Like if you are a coach who gets rabbit ears. You have no chance there. None. No, that's a great point. And also, unlike, say, the Yankees who can go out in free agency, yeah. Georgia as in-state talent, Tennessee always has the challenge of overcoming a, a slight lack of in-state talent. Yeah, well, and it's interesting as we sit in Nashville, I, I do wonder, and this is, not a, this is not a now question, but in 20 years are we talking about Tennessee's in-state talent being significantly better? Sort of like Atlanta now versus Atlanta in the 1990s. Atlanta was a good football town in the 1990s. It is one of the best talent producers in the country now because their population exploded. Nashville's population is exploding too, all of Middle Tennessee. And, and really, you know, East Tennessee's doing that too. People are moving into Knoxville. People are moving to Chattanooga. So it's possible that that part of it gets better. But for now, yes, you do have to cross state lines quite a bit. You need to be able... And I thought Philip Fulmer's coaching staffs did really good jobs with this. They they would go to Georgia, they would go to North Carolina, they would go to Virginia. They didn't mind going out to California if they needed to get somebody. And I, I, I think Tennessee probably has to recruit 
you start regionally, but also go national. And I mean, you look at look at Nico coming in from Long Beach Poly. You know, that if you find the guy you want and that's the right guy, doesn't really matter where he's from. What are some of the? I'm just going to go an open-ended question yeah. here. What are some of the two or three storylines, maybe outside of Tennessee, that you're most excited to see how they unfold this year? Well, I, we're here on a day when when Alabama's here, and I, I think a Nick Saban with a problem to solve is the most dangerous Nick Saban. He's sure. got he's got a Georgia problem to solve. He's got an LSU problem to solve. Uh, the NIL stuff. He he talks about it, and, it, and it's funny. Everybody. It is complaining, but it's a, it's complaining with a purpose because he doesn't go home and be like, "Oh man, I wish NIL were different." He doesn't care. All he all he wants to know are what the set rules are so that he can create the most advantageous situation. And so he's looking at that as as kind of a Rubik's cube in his hand that he needs to solve. And so I just think when he's engaged like that and he's not trying to put out, you know, tell, tell his team, stop listening to everybody telling you how great you are. They're, nobody's telling them how great they are. I'm, I'm pretty sure when the ballots come out tomorrow that everybody here is going to pick LSU to win the West. Like, Alabama doesn't have to worry about all the what Nick Saban calls rat poison right now. They, they just go ahead and, and worry about themselves, which, by the way, still loaded yeah. pretty much every position. Now, the quarterback situation is very unknown right now, but talent-wise, they stack up with anybody. So I, I think that's the thing that, that, that I find very interesting because he's not a person you want to have to deal with when he's coming off a loss or coming off a, a season that, that didn't stack up the way he wanted to because he seems to get more engaged and work even harder at that point. One of the things I'm interested to watch, too, and it would be the other great team right now in, in the past 10 or so years or more in the SEC, and that, that is Georgia. Mm-hmm. When I look at Georgia, you and I were at a time where we covered Philip Homer that I thought he started to let off-field discipline slip a little bit. Mm-hmm. More guys got in trouble. Yeah. And I'm a firm believer, and you play ball for Florida, for those that don't know. I'm a firm believer that when you let off-field discipline slip, and if you're a player, you can get by with stuff, and that starts to erode at team chemistry. Right. Could that happen at Georgia? They've had a lot of off-field issues, I some tragic. I don't see that happening Okay. In, in terms of eroding team chemistry. What happened was a tragedy, that accident, and, and they'll tell you that they got to have everybody stop speeding. But if you pull the, park, uh, the speeding tickets on every major college football program in America, you're going to see something similar. I, you know the attention is on Georgia because one, they had this tragedy and two, they just won the national title for the second time in a row. But if you if you look, I, I remember as a beat writer covering Tennessee, covering Florida, you, you do your courthouse checks and a lot of speeding tickets. It's mm-hmm. it's an eight, it's a group of 18 to 22 year olds. You're going to get that. And so I'm not, I'm not that worried about their chemistry. I mean, Kirby Smart's up here talking about the, the 2021 class where they've kept 17 and 20 signees. Almost all of them are contributing a lot. You know, some of them are, are going to be first-round draft picks. Like They've got better chemistry than almost anybody. Andy Staples, great stuff. You need to check him out on On3. He's going to be throwing high, hot heat. And uh, always love visiting with him. And uh, I'm looking forward to your show, man. You're going to kill it. I appreciate it, Dave. Andy Staples. Yes, sir. Off to Sports War from Nashville, SEC Media Days. We've got it covered this week. We'll talk to you. What a week, Caleb Calhoun. That was Andy Staples, SEC Media Days 2023 from Nashville in the books. Any lasting thoughts? Well, it was it was a, it was a fun ride, but, man, you know, Nashville's got to get a lot of things worked out <laughs> as a city. We had uh, – I mean, it wasn't the full, it wasn't the city's fault fully. We had some rain storms that messed up some of the fun events during the week. But I will say that there is a lot of confidence in Tennessee, but there's a lot of other lower level SEC schools that are very convinced they're going to be better this year. I see a lot of that. I saw a lot of that in Kentucky. I saw a lot of that in Missouri. They seem thoroughly convinced that they're going to take that next, take another step and challenge the East this year. Great. There you go. He's Caleb Calhoun. I'm Dave Hooker. This has been a production.